my interest in the case is solely from a constitutional perspective. And again, even though I'm going to present to you what I think are some of Entergy's better arguments uh, around preemption, you know, I don't have any personal opinion. I mean, I hope Vermont wins, but uh, but I do think it's important that you know we all understand what the legal you know framework is that the case is going to be argued in, so you, you know you, nobody's caught off guard if things don't go our way at least at the beginning of the case. Um, so just for those of you who are, maybe aren't familiar with even the language here, preemption is based on this idea that if Congress has the constitutional authority to regulate an area, and that's usually because it involves interstate commerce, then the federal law takes supremacy over state law vis-a-vis -vis the supremacy clause in the Constitution. And it really is fundamentally an issue of federalism. Um, and sort of this cartoon is actually from the 1930s, um, where you can see the United States is sort of hurting all the states, right? <laughs> this idea that the federal government has control over what happens to the states. So that's just the basic constitutional framework. Now, there are three theories <laughs> of preemption, and you'll probably hear these batted around in the conversation about, about Vermont Yankee. So let me just be clear what this case involves and what it doesn't involve. The first theory of preemption is what we call conflict or impossibility preemption. It's when it's impossible for a party to adhere to both state and federal law, we say federal law trumps. And we see some conflict preemption cases in the Supreme Court. But that's not what Energy's claiming. The second uh, theory of preemption is if Congress expressly preempted state law from governing. So they said, you know, states, you have no role in this. Um, and again, that's also not what Entergy is really arguing. What Entergy is really arguing is the third theory of preemption, which is what sometimes we call pre implied preemption, or sometimes we call uh, field preemption. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as field preemption. And if Congress intended to occupy a field, like they intended to regulate all of nuclear power, then even if there's no express language in the law, federal law would trump state law that was somehow contrary to federal decision making. It doesn't have to be exactly in conflict, but the idea would be, you know, federal law is supreme over the state law if Congress intended that they would be the sole regulators. And it's really that third, that third theory of preemption that Entergy is arguing. So let me just take you back through a few preemption cases, both historically and then most currently, to give, give you just some things to think about. And I, I thought, oh, just before I do that. So there are really two ways you see these preemption cases arise. Most often, you see plaintiffs, individual plaintiffs, suing under state law, usually under state tort law. And uh, the company they're suing claims that federal law bars the plaintiffs from suing. And I'll talk about this in a second, but how many of you remember the Diane Levine case, where Diane Levine lost her arm to Wyeth Industry, to a drug produced by Wyeth Industries? Remember that? It was in the news a lot. And then Diane, and the question there was also a preemption argument. And Diane Levine won that case. They said FDA regulation of drugs doesn't preempt her from suing in state court. That's the most likely paradigm you see these cases arise in, in part because industry, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, you know, most, most often you see the pharmaceutical industry, has wanted to be protected from state court lawsuits. So they don't want to be sued in state courts. They think they're regulated by the federal government and they comply with federal law. That ought to make them immune from being sued by individual plaintiffs. So we look at preemption cases. Those are most of them. There are a few cases, however, where uh, federal law bars courts from enforcing state laws that conflict with federal laws. And so you don't necessarily have an individual plaintiff who's hurt by a company, but you have, like in this case, a company suing the state, saying you can't, or a city, or a government entity, saying you can't enforce your laws against us. Now, uh, in both of these scenarios, even though preemption is really about the relationship between federal government and the state, guess what? Almost never is the federal government a party in these lawsuits. Because they usually are involved some industry suing or being sued. However, I should note that in every federal preemption case, eventually the Supreme Court asks the federal government to weigh in on their opinion. 
In other words, even though in this case the NRC has yet to weigh in, if this case gets up as far as the Second Circuit or the Supreme Court, you know, I'm going to put money, they always do it, they always ask the Solicitor General, what do you think? Do you think the FDA preempts state tort lawsuits? Do you, and they're going to ask, do you think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Atomic Energy Act preempts Vermont law? So even though the federal government isn't a party, they almost always are requested to weigh in. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, let me go back. All right, so let me, how many of you remember the, uh, the Karen Silkwood case? For, uh, for those of you who weren't born in 1984, when I know there are a few of you here, um, this was actually made very popular by a movie starring Cher and Meryl Streep, uh, with Meryl Streep playing Karen Silkwood. Um, you probably heard a lot in the news about Pacific Gas and the California case involving nuclear energy, but Silkwood versus McGee is really the second, and I think one of the most important cases about preemption in nuclear energy. If you remember, for those of you who don't know, Karen Silkwood was an employee at the McGee nuclear power plant, and uh, she was sort of a whistleblower, right? She was concerned about things that were happening inside the plant, and eventually herself was contaminated with some uh, radioactive material. Uh, she sued McGee and then was killed in a inexplicable car accident before the case ever reached trial. And many claim that the nuclear power companies killed her. Uh, on the other side, many people claim that uh, Karen Silkwood herself made herself contaminated and became sort of a martyr of the cause. In any event, there's a lot of mythology around the case. But eventually her family actually sues uh, the, the power plant and claiming that you know they were liable for the damages that they caused her. And um, a jury awarded them significant money, including what we call the law punitive damages, which is not just the actual damages that they suffered, but punishing money to the nuclear power plant for the things it had done wrong. It's sort of a way in which to get them to stop doing those things. And when it got to the Supreme Court, uh, the question was whether or not uh, the um, the question was whether or not the Atomic Energy Act preempted her punitive damages because really it was about safety. If you were going to charge the company more in a lawsuit because it didn't do safety right, then they, well, you can't do that in state court because federal law would preempt that. And actually, uh, Karen Silva's family won a very narrow five to four vote. Uh, and again, a vote that I question would be, um, a, a decision I question which would be upheld today. But in a very narrow question of preemption, the court said that the, uh, the federal law never intended to stop punitive lawsuits. But the dissent bears a very cogent argument to suggest that this was a field occupation. In other words, that what was partially intended by the Atomic Energy Act was to ensure that there were no lawsuits in this area because when the Congress passed the law, they intended the federal government to be the only regulator. So you can see some back and forth in that case about sort of the step two of preemption. Um, I mentioned Wyeth versus Levine uh, because in some ways it now stands as an aberration. If you remember, this is Diane Levine who lost her arm to uh, the drug phenigrin when it was injected off-label. Um, up in a hospital in Barrie. She ultimately won her suit and won her preemption suit by 6-3. Uh, but again, a little bit different scenario, and um, I think, as I said, that stands in aberration. So let me talk just very briefly about a couple of the current preemption cases and why I think they might matter. Uh, you know, preemption is lost. In other words, states have won or state law has won. Williamson versus Mazda, which was a case this term that involved seatbelts and whether or not somebody could sue the manufacturer of a minivan for not having a seatbelt in the middle section, even though the National Highway Transportation Association didn't require it. And that was sort of an easy one, right? That was an 8 to 0. And they said, no, car manufacturers always got to decide how many seatbelts they put in. So this was easy, right? I think this one doesn't count. This one's too easy. In the same way that Chamber of Commerce was too easy, and this was a case that involved, could Arizona make uh, businesses in its state do much more to ensure there weren't illegal immigrants than the federal government was doing? The federal government says, look, we own immigration, you don't immigration. And the court, in a divided opinion along political lines, 
And she said, no, Arizona gets to regulate here. Now, interestingly, it was the conservatives on the court that said Arizona got to regulate, and the liberals on the court that said they didn't. Again, if you know anything about preemption, I think this one doesn't count. Right? The fact that it ruled in favor of Arizona, I think had a lot more to do with the court's view of federal immigration policy than it did with preemption. So these are the ones that don't count. Um, I think these are the ones that start to really count, and they were all decided within the last few months. And so you can see the trend in the court. Uh, Pliva versus Mensing involved another drug labeling, this kind involving a generic drug. You can see the uh, video shot of the plaintiff here. She took a diet drug that had some side effects nobody warned her of. One of those side effects is it created a very rare disease that made you completely incapacitated, which is what happened to her. Generic, she's taking the generic version of the drug, and the generic companies can't alter drug labels on their own without FDA approval. The FDA has never approved the drug change, and they said, oh, conflict, generic drug companies win. You can't sue in state court. So this starts to start to see a change here. And AT&T versus Concepcion, in some ways, is the most pertinent, most recent case that I think is really important. This case involves the Federal Arbitration Act. And essentially, what California says is, look, AT&T had this contract. We're not going to recognize it because it was arbitrated. And we don't recognize class action arbitration. So California law says we only recognize arbitration acts that encompass everybody, including class actions. Federal Arbitration Act doesn't do that, so we don't recognize. Here the court, in a, in a pretty clear decision, said no, Federal Arbitration Act preempts the field. We, like, we think if we were to enforce California law, which is sort of in conflict as a policy matter with federal law, it would sort of undermine the purpose of the Federal Arbitration Act, or allow states to opt out too easily, and that would be a problem when we're talking about a federal state. Um, and then finally, uh, the Bruce Witz versus Wyatt case that was also heard this, team, this term, also with Kathleen Sullivan, who was Entergy's lawyer representing Wyatt. So she is no stranger to the laws of preemption. And here this case involved the Childhood Vaccination Act and whether or not a family could sue in state court if their child was injured by a vaccination, even though Congress had set up a secondary way to sue for damages um, under a federal system. And again, this was really a field preemption idea. The idea that it was Congress who owned the idea, it was Congress who, who, who took over childhood vaccinations, and therefore, if we allow people to sue in state court, it's going to undermine the entire scheme because we want drug manufacturers to keep making these drugs, we want kids to keep getting vaccines, and if you allow people to sue in state court, it's going to sort of screw up that field. That was sort of the basic. Um, so, so let me just give you a couple of observations about this. With, this. with the exception of the outliers I talked about, with the immigration case and Diane Levine's case, which I see as outliers, uh, preemption cases tend to produce very divided decisions, 5-4 or 5-3 if Pagan's recused herself, favoring federal preemption more often than not. In other words, industry gets favored more than individual plaintiffs in these cases. Kennedy is, whenever there's a divided decision, Kennedy was often the swing vote, is always cited with industry over, over plaintiffs. Um, second quick point before I finish up. Um, Sorrell versus IMS was decided last week, which has nothing to do with preemption, but had a lot to do with the way in which the course, court saw the Vermont legislature overreaching and targeting industry it didn't like. And, and while that's not directly relevant to this case, the court will have a memory of that, and I think it's just important to be cognizant that you know, the court might look skeptically on the Vermont legislature's motives and intent, given it's now twice struck down laws which it finds is overreaching. Um, and again, if you look at cases where there's a national agenda within a regulated industry, where there hasn't been, ex the Congress hasn't been explicit about allowing states to regulate. So, childhood vaccinations, arbitrations, etc. Industry tends to prevail. Um, so, 
that's sort of the 20,000 foot view of preemption, which is the trend is trending towards Vermont Yankee, I think. And I think it is no coincidence that Kathleen Sullivan is their lawyer, given that she's had tremendous success before the court just this term in winning a preemption case. That said, you know, it's all unpredictable, and since this is a free talk, I assume that vice you're getting is what you paid for. <laughs> okay, time, you're up. Thank you, I guess that makes it my turn. Is it okay if I sit here? Can everybody see me and hear me? There's only one person who's kind of sitting directly behind the pole, so that we don't have line of sight, but other than that, we sit here. I, I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, there is nobody in Vermont who is less enamored of nuclear power than I am. I think it is in the public interest of this state that Vermont Yankee shut down. I think nuclear power is a suspect technology. I think the low probability, high impact kind of disasters that we just saw in Japan suggest that uh, we are well advised to move forward into the future of Vermont without nuclear power. That said, uh, I, in my capacity as an avuncular law professor, am always troubled when I see uh, people like the US Supreme Court taking positions and making decisions that we perceive as uh, having a funny correlation uh, between the policy preferences of the justices and the legal results that they tend to reach. And just as that concerns me when I see it in the Supreme Court, it concerns me when I see it in everyday discussions of legal subjects at a place like Vermont Law School. If you are Bridget Asse, who is the Assistant Attorney General who is tasked with arguing the state's position for uh, Judge Murtha of the U.S. District Court, your job is to advance the state's position regardless of how strong or weak it is. But here at Vermont Law School, our job is to critically assess the positions of parties that we both agree with and disagree with. And so I get worried when I have yet to hear anybody, other than me, I think, who dislikes, and possibly Professor Anna, uh, who dislikes nuclear power, uh, offer up anything that resembles a positive assessment of Entergy's case. And I'm here to tell you that Entergy does have a colorable argument in its favor. In fact, it has several. Uh, that said, uh, when the world is, uh, when you're a hammer, the world is a nail. So I tend to view the uh, Entergy litigation through the lens of utility regulation. And I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, give you a sense of why I think you need to know a little bit about utility regulation in order to understand the litigation over Vermont Yankee. The electric power industry came into existence here in the United States uh, in the early decades of the 20th century. And at the explicit request of the investor-owned electric industry, uh, each state came to establish a public utility commission that would have the authority to regulate the state's electric companies on a plenary basis. And these investor-owned electric companies essentially made a bargain with the state. The utilities got a monopoly in exchange for the obligation to serve everybody who wanted service, and they were also obliged to charge only the rates that the utility commission approved. So that's the landscape, the utility combat. Utilities obliged to serve, uh, but they get an exclusive franchise, a monopoly, and they have to charge only the rates the commission approved. That was just a great arrangement until 1927. And in 1927, a problem arose. A, the Public Utility Commission in Rhode Island uh, had to regulate a local utility that was doing two, th two things, selling electricity to retail customers in Rhode Island, and also exporting its excess el electricity to a neighboring utility in the state next door, Massachusetts. And uh, the Utility Commission decided a rate proceeding in a way that was not favorable to the Massachusetts utility, they worked their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that the Rhode Island Public Utility Commission had violated the Commerce Clause by purporting to regulate interstate commerce. Now, this case was called Attleboro, and the result of that decision is fabled in the law of public utilities as the so-called Attleboro Gap, which was filled in 1939, I believe it was, when Congress adopted the Federal Power Act. And the Federal Power Act gave what is now called the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, used to be the Federal Power Commission, the authority to regulate a couple of things. One, high voltage transmission of electricity, not concerned about that here. Two, rates for wholesale electricity. And wholesale here means exactly what you think it is. 
sale or resale, or purchase for resale. Fast forward to 1972, uh, when the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant was commissioned. Uh, the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant originally was owned by a consortium of utilities. The lead owners were our two big utilities here in Vermont, CDPS and Green Mountain Power. Under the Federal Power Act that I just told you about, the FERC had the responsibility for approving the wholesale rates that Vermont Yankee charged in order to supply electricity for all of the utilities that owned a piece of it, who would then turn around and sell that energy to all of us at retail. Under that paradigm, the wholesale rates that Vermont Yankee was charging were simply passed right along to those utility customers at retail. And if Vermont Yankee had economic troubles, if the plant got really expensive to run for some reason, or God forbid, if the plant became so broken or dysfunctional that it simply had to shut down and the owners had to write off the costs, all of those costs would flow inexorably onto the bills of you and me, retail electric utility customers in Vermont and around New England. However, and this is very important as you consider the pending energy litigation, in the 1990s, we deregulated our electric industry. Now, when I say we, I don't mean Vermont, because Vermont didn't deregulate its electric industry, but Congress did at the federal level, by which I mean the wholesale level, uh, wholesale level, that is. What do I mean by deregulation? You no longer had to be an electric utility to own generation facilities. So you opened up the electric generation business to companies that were not utilities. And with that opening up came the opportunity for the utilities that owned the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant to sell it to a company that was not a utility. And lo and behold, in 2002, that is exactly what the utilities that own Vermont Yankee did. They sold the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant to an unregulated non-utility company called Entergy Nuclear. Now, if you're savvy about utilities, you know that Entergy also owns regulated utilities, but Vermont Yankee is owned by a unregulated non-utility subsidiary of Entergy. So, Vermont Yankee is no longer a utility. It is called a merchant generator. What does that mean? It means that if Vermont Yankee goes bust, if the fuel rods, uh, if the fuel rod assemblies crack, which is what happened in Maine to Maine Yankee, or if something else goes wrong and the plant has to shut down, those consequences, the financial consequences, do not flow inexorably to your and my utility bills. Who stuck with the consequences? Answer, the shareholders of energy. No utility customers in Vermont or anywhere else. But when Vermont Yankee was sold in 2002, the Department of Public Service negotiated and the Public Service Board, our state utility regulator, approved certain conditions that were designed to keep Vermont Yankee at least somewhat tethered <coughs> to Vermont retail customers through March 21st of 2012, which happens also to be the date that the current NRC license expires. Why did they do that? Well, Vermont Yankee's power, however much you like or dislike nuclear power, is A, relatively cheap, and B, quite reliable. Vermont Yankee operates quite efficiently most of the time. And the agreement I'm talking about is the infamous Memorandum of Understanding, and I brought it with me in case anybody has any questions about it. Okay, so Vermont Yankee, uh, Vermont Utilities got contracts for about half of Vermont Yankee's output and a profit-sharing mechanism for the rest, again, only applicable through March 21st of next year. And Energy agreed to renew its Certificate of Public Good, which is its authority to operate under state law, if it wanted to keep operating after that infamous date, March 21st of next year. This is unprecedented. As to every other generation facility in Vermont, if you and I get together and decide to start one, you just get permission from the Public Service Board to build it, or you get permission to buy it if you want to acquire it, and that's that. You now have authority under state law to operate the plant until it breaks or until you decide to sell it to somebody else. So, I think the Memorandum of Understanding, this document here, was really intended to preserve the Public Service Board's right to assure that Vermont utility customers continue to derive some economic benefit 
from Vermont in, you know, relatively cheap, reliable power, not to regulate the plant's radiological safety. Entergy agreed not to challenge the Memorandum of Understanding on Supremacy Clause grounds, meaning, I think, that Entergy agreed not to challenge the Public Service Board's right to extract economic benefits from Vermont Yankee if it is to continue to operate after March 21st. But then, of course, if you've been following the case, you know that the legislature passed a pair of bills, one in 2005, the next in 2006. The 2005 bill was Act 189, the 2006 bill was Act 160. These two bills purported to give the Vermont legislature, as opposed to just the Public Service Board, the authority to renew Vermont Yankee's Certificate of Public Good. And because the legislature hasn't done that, in fact, the Senate last year rejected a bill to do just that, Entergy has now filed its lawsuit challenging the whole Vermont regulatory scheme as it applies uniquely to Vermont Yankee. Now, here's why I think Entergy has a colorable claim. I think I have about five reasons. One, everybody's been talking about Pacific Gas and Electric, the Supreme Court's 1983 decision. Here's what it says. Regulation of radiological safety is preempted by the Atomic Energy Act, but a state can block the construction of new nuclear power plants on economic grounds. Now, what I would say about Vermont is those economic grounds, the ones that the Supreme Court said were okay in Pacific Gas and Electric back in 1983, no longer exist. Why do they no longer exist? For precisely the reason I've already given you. Electricity was deregulated at wholesale, starting with the Energy Policy Act of 1992. So, because Vermont Yankee is a merchant generator, deregulated, it cannot pass its financial or operational troubles along to retail ratepayers. Although Act 160 purports to regulate other things, stuff like public health, whatever that is, economics, reliability, energy argues, and I think I agree, that there really is no plausible reason for Act 160 other than to impose concerns about radiological safety. My next point is, for Professor Pareto and I spent all day Thursday in court listening to arguments about what the legislature intended when it adopted Act 160, and I gather there was a even further argument and testimony about that the following day. I think that's all irrelevant. Why is it irrelevant? One, courts know that legislative history is unreliable. The three of us all vote for a bill. Maybe I voted for the bill because I wrote the bill, and I know for sure it's the be best piece of public policy ever brought to the State House in Montpelier. Pat Pareto might have voted for the bill because he was not paying attention and meant to vote no, but voted yes by accident. And Professor Hannah might have voted for the bill because she, maybe she just traded her vote on that bill for uh, a yes vote from some colleague on a different bill that she wants, or who knows. Uh, in other words, I can go testify in U.S. District Court about what I intended. These two folks, these two legislators can testify about what they intended. The lawyer for the Department of Public Service Company can go and testify about what they advised the legislature to do. And as they used to say when I was in law school, it's all the equivalent of Cliffy and Normie writing on the back of a cocktail map. Anybody remember who Cliffy and Normie were? From the TV show Cheers, they were the two bar fights. Okay, so I think all that testimony is pretty useless. The state cannot claim, even though it has tried to do so, that it's regulating based on reliability concerns. Three seconds from now, Vermont Yankee trips. Nothing happens. The lights stay on. Why do the lights stay on? Because our grid is being run by a regional transmission organization called ISO New England down in Holyoke. And the system is designed to stay on if a major power plant like the Seabrook plant in New Hampshire, which is 1,200 megawatts, like the Mystic plants, which I think are like 2,400 megawatts down in Boston Harbor, any one of those plants can trip and the lights stay on. That's one reason the state can't claim to be regulating reliability. The other issue, of course, is that Vermont Yankee is terribly reliable. And to the extent there's an effect on reliability, it's arguably what happens if you close Vermont Yankee, not keep it open. So I think it's uh, somewhat illogical to suggest, as Vermont apparently does, that Act 160 regulates reliability. Now notice, 
Vermont Yankee's status as a merchant generator really cuts both ways in this lawsuit. On the one hand, it undermines Vermont's assertion of regulatory authority because Vermont doesn't regulate the economics of Vermont Yankee. On the other hand, it undermines the claim Entergy has made that it's entitled to an emergency injunction to preserve its potential right to operate the plant after March 21st. Why? Because the possibility of being forced to shut down by who knows what circumstances after that date is exactly, exactly the kind of business risk that the company undertook as a merchant generator. Moving that risk from customers to shareholders and investor-owned companies like Entergy is exactly the reason that we opted for deregulation at the wholesale level. So in other words, what we have here is garden variety business risk, not the kind of irreparable harm that justifies injunction relief. Uh, injunctive relief. The last thing I'd like to do is read you a paragraph from the Pacific Gas and Electric decision. Here's the paragraph. First, Congress has occupied not the broad field of nuclear safety concerns, but only the narrower area of how a nuclear plant should be constructed and operated to protect against radiation hazards. States traditionally have possessed the authority to choose what technologies to rely on in meeting their energy needs. Nothing in the Atomic Energy Act limits this authority or intimates that a state, in exercising this authority, may not consider the features that distinguish nuclear plants from other power sources. That language is very favorable to Vermont. Would you agree? Unfortunately, it appears in Justice Blackmun's concurring opinion. And that opinion was joined by only one other colleague, Justice Stevens. As you know, Justice Blackman and Justice Stevens are no longer members of the court, and the majority in Pacific Gas and Electric took a much more preemption favorable view of the Pacific Gas and Electric case. So the next time somebody tells you that Pacific Gas and Electric means that Vermont wins this case, read Justice Blackman's concurrence. And remember, that's not the opinion of the majority of the Supreme Court. And of course, the Supreme Court has changed a great deal since 1983. And as Professor Hanna has eloquently told you, the Supreme Court's view of preemption has changed a great deal since 1983. So with that, I'm now going to let my colleague, Professor Parento, tell me why I was wrong. About <laughs> So, Pacific Gas and Electric means Vermont's going to win. <laughs> and energy knows that. Um, let me set the stage for you, though, because you have to talk about what's happening right now. And what's happening right now, and what happened last week at the two-day hearing, is whether Judge Murtha is going to grant what's known as a preliminary injunction. Right? You all know that. So, whatever decision we get out of Judge Murtha, when we get it, and speculation is we'll probably will not get it before July 4th. It's up to him and his clerks. Um, but whatever decision we get is preliminary. It's not the final decision. It's not the decision on the merits. Um, Judge Murthy has scheduled a trial for September 12th. He moved it up from October, and that was clearly in response to the testimony uh, from the senior energy officials who basically said we're pressing some uh, limits of ordering uh, new rods, new fuel rods, which we have to put into the plant in October, and we have to shut it down, and we have to do this, and we have to do that, and it's all very complicated, and gee whiz, don't push us any further than we have to be pushed in. So the judge said, okay, well, let's set the trial in, let's move the trial up. A clear indication from Judge Murtha that he wants to make a final decision and send this case on its merry way to the next level of review, which would be the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. So what we're talking about today is, will Judge Murtha grant or will he not? He asked three interesting questions um, of the energy witness. One, what would you do if I granted the preliminary injunction? Ah, oh, the energy official perked right up. Very bright smile said, we would order the rods, Your Honor. And he, judge said, ah, but do you understand that a preliminary injunction is just what it says, and you may ultimately lose, and that means that you will have ordered rods and you may not be able to recover the cost for. By the way, how much are we talking about? Oh, $65 million. Hmm. Then he said, what would you do if I do not grant you the preliminary injunction? Yeah. More in sadness than in anger. The energy official said, Your Honor, would you have to seriously consider shutting the plant down right now? Or moving to shutting it down 
It's that serious. We'd all have to fly to New Orleans and talk it over. But the company's going to have to decide. Is it going to stay in business in Vermont or not? If we don't get this injunction, the risks and the uncertainties are going to continue to plague this company, drive talented employees away, scare our bankers, disturb our shareholders, etc. So then the judge said, well, what if I do something in the middle? This is classic Gar Murtha, by the way. And uh, the energy witness, energy witness said, well, what, what might that be? And, and he said, well, I don't know. We, we haven't talked about it or thought about it. But I'm just wondering, maybe we don't give either side everything we want. So there you are. He could grant it. He could deny it. He could grant it in part, deny it in part. But whatever he does, it's only going to be as good as the next few months until September 12th when we will get the final decision in the case. But why do I say if PGE is still the law of the land, energy loses? Um, because I listen very carefully to their arguments, and obviously you can't have a finer constitutional law advocate than Captain Sullivan on your side. Um, I have to say, I think their legal team would have benefited enormously from having my friend Don Crease on the team because their command of the regulatory, energy regulatory aspects of this case, not so impressive. Um, but she's a tremendous advocate. But she pretty quickly acknowledged that she's got to get out from under PGE. How does she do it? One is to say, PGE dealt with new power plants. We've got an existing power plant here. That's a big difference. Um, PGE wasn't dealing with the state shutting down an operating nuclear power plant that had been relicensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. PGE was dealing with a state moratorium on the construction of any new nuclear power plants. That's a big difference. The state's response? Actually, no. It's no difference at all. Why? Because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission itself has said in their regulations, in the decisions they've made in other relicensing cases, in three or four different official documents, over and over, clear as a bell, all we do is decide whether plants are safe. We do not decide whether plants operate. States decide that question, not us, not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We decide safety, safety is us, that's it. Now you heard this buzz recently about Senator Sanders worried that the NRC had taken a vote to intervene in the case. Anybody seen the NRC lately? Yes, at the hearing, I, I understand. But not in the case, and you won't. Take it to the bank. You're not going to see the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ride to the rescue of the energy company in the lawsuit. No, there's no question, at least in terms of the federal government's view of the matter, if that counts, that states have equal rights and opportunities to decide whether existing plants continue to operate when their licenses are up, when their certificate of public good is up, as they do at the initial instance when they're being constructed. No difference, legally, none. Point two, well, as my colleague has said, the PGE situation is different because those were retail plants. This is a wholesale plant. That makes all the difference in the world in terms of preemption. Well, no, it doesn't make any difference in terms of preemption. The Atomic Energy Act is about radiological health and safety. It contains an express savings provisions for states to determine whether on the basis of economics, land use, environment, traditional authority over electric generating facilities, siting, a long, long list of issues that states have historically regulated power plants, nuclear or otherwise. Um, the savings provision saved all of that. 
only took the one strand from the bundle, radiological health and safety. Everything else belongs to the state. The fact that it's a wholesale plant subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of FERC to set rates or approve rates does not mean that FERC has jurisdiction over the facility itself. And Judge Murtha jumped on that point immediately when Sullivan raised it and said, it doesn't, the judge basically said, Federal Power Act you're talking about does not speak to the facilities themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So, the two arguments I've heard so far from Entergy to distinguish away the PG and E case do not get the job done, in my view. What does that leave us with? Is Vermont deciding to shut this plant down? If it's deciding to shut it down for reasons other than safety, what are they? Now here I express and confess a little disappointment in the way that the state has thus far handled this issue in the litigation. Had it been me, I would have been waiting for that question and I would have taken all of the three hours that Sullivan took to go through the legislative history with sound bites, and I would have laid out one, two, three, four reasons why this plant should be shut, even if it's the safest nuclear plant in the world. I didn't hear that. I did not hear that. I heard. Well, the legislature considered things like air and water quality. Well, that's a good start. What did they do with that? Is what I did not hear. There are things like emissions, diesel emissions, there's traffic, there, a kind of laundry list of things that might be a basis for a decision, but in my judgment, not the kind of bomb-proof presentation that I would have liked to have seen the state Make. Now, we're talking about uh, a legislative process that consumed thousands of hours, generated 2,500 pages of testimony and documents and reports. Surely, in all of that rich material, has to exist a very strong, cogent, rational presentation for why the legislature of Vermont does not want this plant to continue operating. The state's briefing on the issues is very strong. Their position, their legal position, is fine. It's what you would expect. Their position is simply statutes are presumed constitutional. We have no burden to prove they're constitutional. Entergy must prove they're not constitutional. Entergy's arguments that you can ignore the plain texts of the statutes which do not utter the words radiological health and safety. On their face, these statutes say nothing about radiological health and safety. They do not purport to regulate those matters with respect to the plant. They do use words like public safety, which got a lot of attention at the year. And what does public safety mean? Judge Murph is very interested in answers to that question. Entergy's basic point is these statutes, even though they on their face do not purport to regulate safety, are all about safety. Safety, safety, safety. That's what we heard from Ms. Sullivan at least 15 times. Um, so this is a significant bet that Entergy can convince first Judge Murtha, and then we'll see what happens after that, first Judge Murtha that the plain text of the statute, which is every first year law student learns, is the place that you start and often finish with statutory interpretation, does not matter here. What matters is what was on the minds of the 180 members of the legislature as they debated and discussed and ultimately passed these laws. In no small measure, their argument is it's all a subterfuge. This is all pretext. This, there's nothing here but safety. 
It's the dog that didn't bark, as Attorney Sullivan liked to say. It's silence on anything other than safety. And the words that they do use, public safety, that's code for radiology, radiation. Reliability, that's code for safety. Um, as I said in my blog, good luck with that. Um, the PGE case dealt with the very same issue. Return with us now to those wonderful days of 1983. Who was governor of California? <laughs> governor Moonbeam. Well, how did he get elected as an anti-nuclear advocate? What else had happened? There had been a referendum to shut down Diablo Canyon. It was all safety, safety, safety. That was the backdrop for the statute that was enacted, the Warren Alquist Act in 1983. That's what's the argument of the utilities in the PGE case. That's why the Inter-Nuclear Regulatory Commission intervened on behalf of the utilities in the PGE case. It was all about safety. Everybody knew it was about safety. There was no question, but what they were motivated by was safety. So what did the United States Supreme Court say? We don't delve into the mental processes of the legislators who enacted the statute. The legislative history is subject to multiple interpretations. We will not gainsay the state's basis for declaring a moratorium based on economic grounds. So I see no way out of PGE for energy. Would PGE be overturned by the current Supreme Court? We don't know. Stay tuned. We'll all find out together, perhaps. End. There's a couple of my administrative law students in the, in the room, and if only to prove that I haven't forgotten the administrative law that I taught them, I gotta say, how many people here think that Judge Murtha is obliged to defer to whatever views the Nuclear Regulatory Commission may have expressed or be thought to have expressed about uh, the merits of this case? Yeah, see, nobody's raising their hand, particularly my students, because they know that really there's no principle, there's no Chevron deference that applies to whatever opinions commissioners of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission may have expressed about whether it retains the exclusive authority to decide whether that plan continues to operate or not. Doug, can I just weigh in there though? In every preemption case that has gone up to the court, where, where whatever the regulating agency has not weighed in, the Supreme Court has requested a briefing from the Solicitor General. So for, if you remember, the Diane Levine case took a really long time. Like, why is it taking so long for the court to grant cert on that case? Because they went, they said, we will not hear this case until we get weigh in from the Solicitor General on whether or not they think the FDA regulation preempts her lawsuit. And the Solicitor General had to go back and they had to consult with the, you know, the Office of the White House, they had to consult on policy, they had to consult with the FDA, and they had to come back. And I think the reason why Diane Levine was successful in that case was because the FDA said, well, we don't read this as preemption. Now, in the cases where the, where the federal government has weighed in, sometimes they lose and sometimes they haven't. But I have yet to see a preemption, federal preemption case where the Supreme Court has not said we're not going forward without the Solicitor General's opinion. So, so just keep in mind, I'm not saying that they have to defer, Don, but, but I, I would anticipate at some point, if it gets up to the, the Supreme Court, that the government's going to have to weigh in one way or another. Now, it may weigh in deferential to say, we simply defer to the court on this one. We don't know, but I doubt that. Um, you know, I think at some point the federal government is going to be forced to take a, take a position on this. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, also read a brief paragraph from Pacific Gas and Electric, because it really, I, I think Pat has misread what Pacific Gas and Electric actually says. Uh, we should not become embroiled in attempting to ascertain California's true motive uh, for two further reasons, the court says, beyond the actual text of the law. First, inquiring the legislative motive is often an unsatisfactory venture. It's already made that point. Second, it would be particularly pointless for us to engage in such inquiry here when it is clear that the states have been allowed to retain authority over the need for electrical generation facilities easily sufficient to permit a state so inclined to halt the construction of new nuclear plants 
by refusing on economic grounds to issue certificates of public convenience in individual proceedings. That's why I gave you that long disposition about utility law, because I think that ground has been wiped out from under the feet of states by virtue of wholesale electric industry deregulation. There simply are no economic consequences to the state of Vermont anymore arising out of the fact that Vermont Yankee either exists or doesn't exist. Jeff, um, let's get some is, there, is there a contractual argument that is separate from preemption? Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the negotiations uh, embodied in the MOU and say that it doesn't matter whether there's preemption on a regulatory basis because the parties freely sat down and then into a contract uh, and uh, which is, uh, is different than these other, you know, different than the typical preemption issue where you've got states trying to regulate directly, federal government uh, trying to regulate directly, and you're talking about whether there is space for both. Here there's something completely, uh, well, that, that might have been going on, but there was something completely separate, arguably, which was a meeting of the minds on a, uh, on a contract and uh, the ability to enforce that contract against the private party uh, energy. And why do you even have to go to the preemption uh, issue? Why don't you just look at the contract issue? That came up earlier. Let me take a quick cut of this and let you guys get into um, Sullivan went right after that and said, we can't waive our preemption rights. We can't waive federal preemption. That was her response to this. So she didn't, she didn't get into the question of, is it a contract, is it not a contract? Their, their position is, if it is a contract, the state has repudiated it by enacting a law that took the jurisdiction away from the PSB and vested it in the legislature. That's one of their arguments. So if there was a contract, it's been repudiated. But her bigger point, really, the one she stressed was, we can't waive preemption. Ah, but that's not what the state's arguing. If you listen carefully to their argument, that's not what they're arguing. They're arguing what you're saying. They're saying, you bargained with us. We had turned you down uh, initially and said, we are not going to approve the sale to energy of this plant unless you agree to everything that's in this memorandum of agreement. Explicitly saying, we hereby waive any rights to sue you under the supremacy clause for preemption. In my judgment, that is exactly the kind of clause I used to draft when I was at EPA, which is called a covenant not to sue. It's, it's an enforceable, contractual commitment, and that's the way the state is using it. They're saying, the energy, you cannot come into equity court and ask for an injunction when you are in the absolute violation of the commitments and the agreement that you made, and this is an enforceable covenant not to sue. I'll let you guys Sharon, you want to go first, if you like. I, I think that uh, at, this, at the circuit court and the Supreme Court, the memorandum of understanding will be considered relatively relevant for a couple of reasons. One is, I think that Kathleen Sullivan's argument that, that you know, well, we might have been compelled to sign a supremacy, you know, sign away our rights to sue, that if, if that becomes an enforceable contract, it, it should be void for public policy. Be, and that's what she's saying, you can't wait for preemption, because if that were the case, and this is how the argument I think would sound if played out in more detail, every state that negotiates with the nuclear power plant will of course put that in there, right, so they'll never be subject to lawsuit when these things happen, completely undermining the ability of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to play its role in the regulation of nuclear power. So, you know, no clause in a contract is any good if it's void for public policy. Secondly, I think the factual argument that, well, the original memorandum of understanding subjected us to a neutral arbitrator, the Public Service Board, a quasi judicial arbitrator that had some expertise in the area, that that memorandum got changed, right? The understanding, you know, is no longer in force when then the decision got moved to the legislature, which is inherently a political body. I don't know about the arguments, but they made a big deal about it in the briefing. So, you know, I think, I mean, you know, it's interesting you say that Kathleen Sullivan didn't know a lot about the nuclear regulatory industry. I think, I sort of think she doesn't need, I don't think she really wants to focus on that, right? Because I think she's going to, huh? I think she's really trying to get, not, I don't think anybody, I mean, not, not that nobody cares what Martha does, but, you know, the real play will be what happens in the circus. Supreme Court, and they're not going to make this decision based on the kind of nuanced understanding that, that Don has so well 
you know, given us, they're going to want to be looking at it from a 50,000 foot view, which is saying, you know, this is a fundamentally a question of federalism, and to be all small states like Vermont that have a history of, and I, I say this not glibly, have now come before us twice before in clearly overreaching cases. Are we going to, you know, are we going to let states sort of undermine the authority of an expert federal agency that is dealing with important questions of both safety and of a national energy supply? And I think that, you know, I think the state's got to have a good response to that, um, or a better response to that than I think it's had so far. Yeah, I think I agree with everything Cheryl just said. Uh, essentially, uh, Vermont uh, en Energy explicitly agreed to subject itself to the jurisdiction of the Public Service Board with regard to continued authority under state law to operate after uh, March 21st of next year. But it says, uh, we waive any claim we may have that federal law preempts the jurisdiction of the board to take the actions and impose the conditions agreed upon in this paragraph to renew. And I think the proposition that uh, Entergy thereby agreed to possible oversight by the legislature just doesn't pass the milk test, as I said on the radio. Well, why? Because it's just like having a subsidiary enter into a contract. The parent of the subsidiary can always instruct the subsidiary to do whatever it wants or bring the authority vested in the subsidiary up to the parent level, and that's clearly established contract law. <clears throat> and corporate law, and I don't see this really as anything different. The legislature always could either uh, instruct or bring up to itself the power that it had simply delegated to the public service board. Public service board is a creature of the state government. You know, it, it, uh, so I don't, I don't buy that argument at all. Yeah, in PGE, the same argument was made because the legislature imposed a moratorium and the utility said, yeah, but you've got this utility commission here that's supposed to make those decisions. The Supreme Court said the legislature can make that decision. The other thing is, Murtha asked them specifically, well, if you don't, if you, do you want to go back to the PSB when, when they were making, when she was making this point? And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 we don't want to go back to the PSB. They're what? They're tainted at this point. So, you know, energy is too clever by half. John? Well, I just want to say before you uh, call in Professor Echeverria, that Entergy has a problem. I don't think it's what it agreed to subject itself to in this document. I think it's the fact that of the two bills we're talking about here, Act 189 from 2005 and Act 160 from 2006, Entergy actively lobbied the legislature in favor of Act 189. So you hear all this tape and cord of you know, various lobbyists for Entergy going in and telling the legislature to pass the very, one of the two very bills whose constitutionality they're now challenging. That makes energy look bad. Right, right, right. But, but this, even if energy, I, and again, I don't disagree that that, that, I don't disagree with your argument. I just think that, you know, it's a colorful argument on behalf of energy. John? Um, just a follow up, two points. First, just to follow up on this uh, follow up week. Um, I don't know what, on what basis the state could deny energy the permission to buy the plant. But assuming they had broad authority to do that, oh, yeah. and they exercise their discretion to grant authority, then the, the problem of what the contract says seems to fall in the category of uh, unconstitutional conditions, type analysis, or borrowing from my takings expertise, a Nolan Dolan problem, where you could deny a developer permission to go forward, but you grant them a permit on certain conditions that look a lot like takings. And as long as there's some kind of nexus um, you can get away with it. So it strikes me as a really rich and, and complicated question. The second thing I wanted to raise, though, was um, assume energy, energy is right. Um, should we be concerned as citizens about the nature of the regulatory process that we have in nuclear power, particularly given the experience in Japan? As I understand, the position is that there's a matter of radiological safety. States have no say. It all belongs to the federal government. All the authorities invest in the atomic energy. According to Professor Gorton, last time I talked to him, every single time the atomic energy commission has been asked to renew a license for a, for a, 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 a uh, nuclear power plant, and they've granted the license, and the issuance of the license has been challenged in court, the courts have rejected every single legal challenge, scores of legal challenges. So in a sense, you know, looking at our entire governmental system, 
federal systems, different branches of the federal government. In practical fact, all of the authority over nuclear power is vested in one expert federal agency, which may or may not be awake. It may not be any more awake than the safety regulators in Japan. And should we be concerned that nuclear power, that the safety of nuclear power is very much suspect based on this, this, this political administrative process that's been set up to regulate nuclear power? Where's too Peter much Bradford power has been vested in, in the worst. Yeah, you need to talk to Peter Bradford. That's, that's what he's about. I mean, there's been a lot of press about, about the NRC uh, sort of being in the bad pockets of industry. But I think, John, what you raised, I think, is the more fundamental question about this case, which is, I think the best argument as to why Vermont should win, Pat has said, which is if Vermont loses, it means the federal government can conscript a state, can force a state to accept nuclear power.